Welcome to Unit 9. In this unit, we're going to discuss interpretation and construction of contractual terms. In this specific subunit, we're going to discuss how a judge will construe contractual terms without the aid of any type of extrinsic evidence. With Unit 9, we begin the second part of our course. And here's the roadmap. This is where we've been. Remember Contracts 1? We talked about formation of contracts. We talked about assent. We talked about reasonably certain material terms. We talked about consideration. And then we discussed various formation defenses. Now, in this part, with Unit 9, we begin the second part of the course, as I said. We'll call it Contracts 2. And in this part of the course, we're going to talk about interpretation and construction of contracts. We're going to talk about performance defenses, or as they're also known as, excuses. Uh, we'll talk about contractual breach and failure of conditions. Uh, we'll move into remedies for breach of contract. Uh, we'll discuss assignment of rights under a contract and delegation of duties under a contract. And finally, we'll talk about third party beneficiaries, when a third party can sue under a contract between A and B. All right, let's set ourselves up for this unit. In this unit, we're going to be talking about interpretation and construction of contractual terms. So we'll have a written contract, and then the parties have differing interpretations of a contractual term. Sometimes the parties will not have any type of extrinsic evidence. They'll just say, my reading of this contract is such. And the other party will say, no, no, I read it differently. Right? This is construction. We don't call this interpretation. We call it instruction. If you call it interpretation, that's fine. Sometimes I'll slip up and call this interpretation. But this is construction. When you have no extrinsic evidence and you're just looking at the document itself, the words in the document itself, that is called construction. This is a matter of law, which means the judge will do this alone without the help of a jury. So we call this construction. The judge will construe the contract terms without the help of a jury when the parties have differing, differing interpretations of a contractual term and they don't have any extrinsic evidence to support their interpretation or construction. Uh, the next is when we use extrinsic evidence. So parties, once again, have differing interpretations of a contract term and uh, now they have some sort of extrinsic evidence that supports their particular interpretation. We say that this is a matter of fact, which means that the jury has to hear the evidence and determine what the parties agree to. Is it that party's interpretation or is it the other party's interpretation? Once again, this is a matter for the jury, and this we call interpretation and not construction. If you get these mixed up, it's not a big deal. Just remember, when you're not using extrinsic evidence, it's the judge's job to interpret the contract or construe the contract. If you're using extrinsic evidence, then the matter goes to the jury, and it's the jury's job to interpret the contract. It's the jury's job to find the fact. What is the fact? What did the parties agree to? All right, let's talk about the various different types of extrinsic evidence. So extrinsic evidence can simply be testimony. One party gets on the stand and says, and gives some sort of evidence outside the four corners of the contract. If it's just the language of the contract, then it's not extrinsic evidence. So there might be other witnesses who witness the contracting process, or you might have experts who come on and then say what this term means in a contract, et cetera. Uh, course of performance, course of dealing, and usage of trade. We've talked about those before. We'll talk about them again. But those are also considered extrinsic evidence. Uh, dictionary definitions, probably not extrinsic evidence. Most courts don't consider dictionary definitions to be extrinsic evidence. Finally, a very important category of extrinsic evidence is what we call parole evidence. And I think that this is the type of uh, extrinsic evidence that you're going to run into the most. Parole evidence is some sort of prior or contemporaneous written or oral agreement, and then we have a written contract. So let me just set that up a little bit better. We have a written contract. It has its terms, 
but the parties say before that we agreed that this would mean X or besides what we put in the written contract we also agreed that now that could be orally or it could be written but it's just something outside of our written contract so the parties have a written contract but before that they had negotiations discussions they might have said I agree to this and you agree to that and then for some reason that doesn't make it into the written contract that is called parole evidence. Sometimes it's also called parole evidence. Actually, I think the proper pronunciation is parole evidence. For some reason, I can't bring my tongue to say it that way. So it's parole evidence, but it's not parole like you get let out of jail, get let out of prison for, that has an E at the end. This is P-A-R-O-L. So once again, focus on that. This is going to be the type of evidence that we see the most in this unit, parole evidence. All right, let's talk about construction of contracts. Remember, construction of contracts is for the judge. The judge will do this without the help of a jury. Why? Because we have no extrinsic evidence. We just have the document. We just have the written contract. When the judge is presented with an opportunity to interpret a contract and there is no extrinsic evidence, then it is the, judge, the judge's job to interpret the contract. And once again, we said this is construe, this is construction of a contract. Now, the judge just doesn't do this based on his or her feelings. The judge has to follow a general rule. And the general rule is the objective approach to contract interpretation. Remember when we talked about contract formation, we talked about the objective approach to contract formation. Would a reasonable party have believed that the other party was assenting to a contract? Well, in this situation, we're not talking about assent to a contract. We're talking about the terms of the contract. So we're asking, what would a reasonable person believe these contract terms to mean? Now, there are certain maxims, right? That's the general principle. Here are some specific maxims that a judge will look at to help her construe a contractual term when the parties are not presenting any type of extrinsic evidence to support their differing interpretations. So the first one is interpret the ambiguity uh, in a contract against the party who drafted the contract. The second one is the expression of one excludes all others. The third is of the same kind or class. The fourth is specific terms trump general terms. And the last one is negotiated terms trump boilerplate terms. We'll look at these one by one, but these are all serving the same general principle. And the general per principle is what would a reasonable person <clears throat> excuse me, interpret the contract term to mean? All right, let's look at our first maxim. Our first maxim is interpret the ambiguity against the party who drafted the contract. So here's a basic fact pattern so you get the idea. Uh, there's a construction contract. The owner insists on using its form contract. So we have a construction contract, we have an owner and a contractor. There's a contract, but it's the owner's form, right? So it's a contract of adhesion. Uh, the form agreement allows the contractor to demand payment from the owner for certain additional expenses. So if I run into some additional expenses, I can ask the owner to pay for these under certain circumstances. Uh, the written contract requires the contractor to submit a detailed itemization of expenses and a CPA's report thereon. So this is the contract term. If the contractor wants to claim additional expenses from the owner, the contractor must submit a detailed itemization of expenses and a CPA's report on the detailed itemization of expenses. So the contractor submits a compilation letter from a CPA. And basically what a compilation letter from a CPA does is just it adds things up and says, yeah, this adds up. And the owner says, no, no, no. we wanted a more thorough CPA audit of your itemization, right? I wanna make sure that you actually had these expenses. So if it lists an expense, it itemizes an expense, the CPA will go through its auditing procedures to ensure, 
to a certain degree that the contractor actually incurred that expense. But that's not what the uh, contractor provided. A pr contractor provided just a simple compilation letter. Well, what does the contract require? It just says a CPA's report. It doesn't specify whether it is a compilation letter or an audit. So if we are the judge, we might rely on interpreting the ambiguity against the drafter of the contract. Who's the drafter of the contract? In this case, the owner was the drafter of the contract. It is the owner's form, the owner's uh, contract of adhesion. Use this form or we have no deal. And in that case, uh, there's a strong argument that the judge should construe the contract against the owner. In other words, that the contract, the contractor's uh, interpretation that a, a compilation letter was sufficient was reasonable. The next maxim we're going to discuss is uh, the expression of one excludes everything else. And let's look at a simple example. So in a contract for the sale of a house and its appliances, there is a provision that says appliances, excuse me, appliances include the washer, the dryer, the oven, the refrigerator, and the dishwasher. So now the parties have a differing interpretation of it. The buyer says that should include the microwave and the seller says, no, it shouldn't. Now the judge is construing the contract because they have no extrinsic evidence. If the judge applies this maxim, the expression of one excludes everything else, then the microwave is not included. The idea is that if you make a list of things, that is an exclusive list, that is an exhaustive list, and it doesn't include anything else. Here they made a list of the appliances. That list does not include the microwave, so it would not be included in the sale of the house and the appliances. And you might say, well, how do I draft this? So I can show that it's just an example of things. It's not an exhaustive list. Well, you could put in without limitation. So appliances, appliances include without limitation, and then you list things. And that's telling the reader of the contract that these are just examples of things and it's not an exhaustive list. That brings us on to the next maxim. And the next maxim is of the same kind or class. And this is related to our last max maxim. The expression of one excludes everything else. Well, of the same kind or class is related. Now, here's another example. It's very similar to our last example. We have a list of things. So an insurance policy that covers a business for the following, uh, following things. This policy covers the business for loss in the event of an act of God, including without limitation, we have that limit without limitation there, earthquake, tornado, hurricane, hailstorm, tsunami, etc. So we read this and we see a list, but we know we're not going to apply the expression of one excludes everything else because the drafter of this contract put in without limitation and etc telling the reader that this is not an exhaustive list. So the insured business says, we had an employee who suffered a major heart attack and that's an act of God and I should be covered. And the insurance company says, no. So once again, the judge is construing this contract because we have no extrinsic evidence and the judge will look at that list and say, okay, an act of God, including earthquake, tornado, hurricane, hailstorm, tsunami is a uh, heart attack by a key employee, employee of the same kind or class as those things listed. Remember Sesame Street? Remember one of these things is not like the other? Well, is uh, a heart attack by an employee, excuse me, not a heart attack by an employee, an employee's heart attack, is that an act of God similar to an earthquake, tornado, hurricane, hailstorm, tsunami, etc. Probably not. It looks like the list of things is listing natural disasters. And while a heart attack by an employee is natural and it's unfortunate, it's not something that we would put in the same kind of cla or class as those uh, natural disasters. All right, our next maxim is specific terms trump 
general terms, right? So a contract is going to have some very specific things. It's going to have some general things. So a contract for the renovation of a kitchen provides two clauses. It is contractor's responsibility to apply for all necessary approvals and permits for the project. So this contract is putting the responsibility to get approvals uh, by the contractor. So the contractor is responsible for getting approvals. That's the general provision of the contract. But then there's a specific provision. Homeowner shall submit a request to the homeowners association for work on the project on Sunday. So the homeowner lives in a condo and the homeowners association probably has a rule that says you can't do construction on Sunday. It will disturb everybody while they're home. Uh, if you want, you can ask for a waiver of this provision if the homeowners association approves. So now the question is, who's responsible for getting the homeowners association's approval? Well, if you look at the first general clause, it looks like the contractor is responsible. But the more specific clause says that the homeowner is responsible for this specific approval. The last maxim we're going to discuss is negotiated terms trump boilerplate terms. What are boilerplate terms? Well, boilerplate terms are terms that are in every contract. Almost every contract will have these terms. Uh, for example, most contracts have a term, a provision on notices. And it may look so something like this. Any notice by either party under the contract must be provided in written form at least 14 business days before the relevant event. So you have to provide notice 14 days before whatever you're providing notice about. That's boilerplate. It's in the section on notices. But the parties negotiated something special for this contract, and it's change orders. So once again, we have a construction contract, and we have an owner, and we have a contractor. And sometimes the contractor is going to say, listen, oh, excuse me, sometimes the owner is going to say, listen, I want to change things up. Instead of doing this, let's do this. And under those circumstances, the owner will provide the contractor with a change order. And this contract says, owner must provide that change order, notice of change order, at least 30 days before the next phase, the relevant phase of the construction project will begin. So we have two different clauses. We have boilerplate that says notices require 14 days, and then we have this specific negotiated clause which says change orders have to be provided 30 days before the relevant event. So owner provides a contractor with 17 days notice for a change order. So which one applies? Well, if we're looking at this negotiated terms, Trump boilerplate terms, then the negotiated terms is 30 days. Negotiated terms are 30 days. And you might say, wow, this looks very similar to the last maxim we had, where specific terms trump general terms. Yes, often the boilerplate and negotiated are going to overlap with the specific and the general. 